Thanks, everyone. Uh, as you know, the judges are uh, downstairs deliberating over the three finalists, so uh, they'll come back hopefully soon with our winner. But in the meantime, we have our evening entertainment. Our keynote this, this, uh, this evening is uh, Tom Wilson. Tom's the Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Innovation Officer for uh, New Jersey-based Tagla Rosa. Did I get that right? Tagla Rosa. Oh, Tagla Rasa. I totally asked him before and I totally forgot. Tagla Rasa, Healthcare is JRS Innovation Center. And tonight we're going to learn a little bit more about blockchain and how it can be applied to cities. So, Tom, thank you very much. So, great. Thanks for having me here. Um, basically, what we do at Tagla Rasa is we do uh, medication therapy management helping patients, uh, managing their medications through science with uh, genomics and personalized based medication. And with the Innovation Center, we look at using the blockchain uh, to help us with that challenge and help connect patients and get them into more control with their healthcare data. Um, so what I want to do tonight is really just talk about the basics of blockchain give you a level set of all the components of blockchain, uh, really hopefully get you an understanding of what blockchain is at a high level, high technology, and then talk about some use cases. And my goal is to give you enough information so that you can start to look at some of the problems that you're having in your city data, open data, and see if blockchain may be a good fit. So, uh, you know, the big question, if you read the news, blockchain, there's a, a lot of buzz out there against it. It's a, it's a silver bullet to solve all of our problems, right? Um, well, you know, that's not necessarily the case. But uh, I'm going to try to break down the simple definition of the blockchain and just break it down so everyone can really get a good idea of what this technology really is. So there's really three major characteristics of any kind of blockchain. Blockchain is a technology, and there's several different open source projects that implement it. The uh, first characteristic is the ledger. The ledger you can think of as a database, a data store. There's a couple of facets of that ledger. It is append only or immutable, and it cannot be, and the data in that cannot be removed, right? So basically you have your first characteristic is a ledger or a database. The second one is all the transactions on the blockchain are crypt cryptographically signed, right? So they are cryptographically signed so that you can be guaranteed of all the participants in the transaction when that transaction gets written to the blockchain. The third is shared. So the shared attribute of the blockchain means that it's decentralized. It is peer-to-peer, -peer and it's uh, spread, so there's no one central resource that holds all the data. Every single peer on the system has access to the data. So when you put all these together, together you get sort of a shared, secure ledger or database, and that's sort of your high-level definition of the blockchain. Now there's some additional wrinkles to that, and hopefully if you're familiar you'll probably understand these terms, but if you're not, I'm going to try to explain some of these terms that really takes blockchain to more than just a ledger that's shared everywhere. And uh, that is how it builds consensus. So with consensus, when a transaction or a block of transactions get requested to be written to the blockchain, there are several nodes in that blockchain participating to process those transactions. They all work together, and there's sort of two major types of ways that they work to get that transaction on the blockchain. One is called proof of work, and proof of work you may have heard about Bitcoin and Bitcoin miners and people going to get their um, mining equipment together and they will go and every time a transaction comes in, they have the opportunity to 
um, essentially mine that transaction and they get paid in some sort of token to do the work. And this is called proof of work and it's very energy inefficient, right? Mm -hmm. it, some may argue if, if you were to go and create your own mining rig right now on Bitcoin that you would pay more electricity to run it than you would get paid to, to do the, the blockchain. Um, so, so proof of work is one way to do it and Bitcoin and other public blockchains use this uh, currently. Um, but there's another way and uh, I would like to talk about the other way a little bit it is called proof of stake. And proof of stake is a little bit more efficient instead of actually doing these hard cryptographic uh, problems to get uh, trans transactions written on the blockchain, proof of stake actually looks at it more like a voting system. And these peers work together to come up with a vote and then a consensus is built on that voting system, which is very energy efficient and uh, doesn't cost as much as as much energy, if you will, to compute to create a consensus. Now there's all kinds of different proofs out there, there's all kinds of papers, but largely these are probably the two most popular public ones out there. Um, there are some private blockchains where you can write your own consensus model. You can build your own consortium and you can work together to establish that consensus model. But the one common rule with blockchain is that you have this decentralized shared ledger and the peers work together to come to provide a consensus of whether these transactions can or cannot be written to the ledger or blockchain. So far so good? Everybody good? Cool. So now we're going to get into some interesting things. So around 2013, 2014, um, looking at blockchain technology, a lot of innovators started looking at this idea of, well, we can write transactions. Um, that's pretty simple. But what if we wanted to write data? It is a data store. What if we want to record data that means something more than just 20 tokens were traded from Tom to Jason, right? <laughs> um, so they started looking at this idea of running code on the blockchain. And a very popular project called Ethereum was born around 2014. And Ethereum was one of the first to really take uh, not only looking at this problem of running code and this idea of creating contracts that can execute on the blockchain, which uh, Basically, in 2013, you just basically had to run a different blockchain network for every type of transaction. If you wanted a voting system, you would need a different network. If you wanted a um, supply chain system, you would need a different network. So he really sort of took the idea of um, this running code on the blockchain and said, why do you have to have a different network if you have a different contract? Why don't we have this notion of smart contracts? And these smart contracts are actual code that you write and you actually publish to the blockchain. So then any participant can call that contract and essentially execute your code. And uh, that's where blockchain really starts to get interesting, right? It starts to open up the door for um, uh, all kinds of, of use cases. But it also starts to get really hard because you're writing code and you're publishing it to this public network, that code is available for everyone. And if you publish it with a bug, then someone can quickly and easily take advantage of that and start using that, um, that code, that execution code for reasons that you may not have intended. So it does require a special uh, rigor, uh, a special, um, you know, attention to detail than this um, you know environment that we may be used to in the web is you know uh, make it work uh, make it um, right and then make it fast you want to take a different approach uh, and be you know be very sure that it works as you intended um, especially if you're dealing with finance or if you're dealing with data sensitive issues because you don't want that data to be used um, in an unintended way so, 
how we interact with the blockchain. Uh, we have these smart contracts where we can write code and have it run on the blockchain, but how do we call that code as participants? And basically, you uh, have this idea of a wallet. You may have heard of a digital wallet for Bitcoin or Zcash, um, but this wallet really allows you to participate on the blockchain as a node. You have access to all the data, and you basically have a private key and a public key. Your private key is what you use to sign your transactions. Your public key is what you use to share to everyone on the blockchain, so if they want to transact with you, they have that public key, and they can create transactions on the blockchain with you. So if they wanted to send you tokens, or if you wanted to vote, you would share that public key. Now, it's very important that when you participate on the blockchain that no one sees your private key. Your private key is your key and it needs to be in a very safe place. So this digital wallet sort of gives you the ability to um, request for transactions on a blockchain or blockchain network. Now there's another side of that. So if smart contracts run on the blockchain, digital wallets allow you to call the blockchain. How do you get services from the outside world, whether it's the weather, whether it's a temperature reading from a sensor, whether it's um, a service from Amazon or an AI machine learning service, how do you connect to that? And uh, the way you connect to those services on a blockchain network is what's called blockchain oracles. Uh, it's not the company oracle, it's blockchain <laughs> oracles, right? And, and these oracles are basically participants on the chain that can send feeds of information to the chain so that you can react. And you can write these smart contracts to be aware of the oracles at the time you publish that contract. So when a participant requests the weather, they, uh, the contract can receive a feed of weather updates for a given city or, or whatever and notify the requester of that weather through blockchain, and that transaction can get written. I'll give better examples as I go, but the, the gist of the oracles is they allow you to connect to services through the blockchain without you having to know the exact API. So let's say there's 20 weather services out there, they all have a different API. You can go and request a transaction on the blockchain, and you can get all those services without having to know all the different APIs if there's an oracle that serves those for you. Um, machine learning oracles can consume the data and provide feedback. Uh, Internet of Things devices can serve, physical devices can serve through oracles and providing data. So that's how data gets from the outside world into the blockchain. So when you see these oracles, they're, they're, they're all uh, connected and they're all participating on the blockchain and you get this notion of pure decentralization and that's one of the really cool parts of blockchain is this idea of no one central store so if one node fails you still have access to the data actually if you have a wallet you have access to the data so to me uh, blockchain really really uh, enables you to have true open data that's delivered to anyone that's participating on the network. You have access to it. Um, and, and again, that data can be encrypted and you can use your keys to determine who gets to see what, so you can make decisions about that. Uh, but at the end of the day, all of your, your, your shared uh, state ledger is everywhere, every node that's participating. So you can kind of think like this, which will probably sound a little bit crazy at first, but you can kind of think of blockchain technology with smart contracts and oracles and these wallets as one sort of global computer. Every blockchain network, instead of being a PC or a mobile device, is actually one sort of giant shared computer that's actually running code and that code is running around all the nodes uh, around the, the world. 
Um, and it's kind of crazy when you, when you think that way, but at the same time, it's very empowering. So once you start to wrap this around your head, you know, immediately you'll start to think of all of these amazing use cases and you'll come down to reality. Um, <laughs> but it, it is uh, kind of interesting how it, it with the uh, decentralized consensus model and not having to have one central store to provide that, um, that consensus of this is truth or not, or one central area where your data resides is, is very interesting. So why all this? So that's, you know, the blockchain 101. So hopefully everybody's head's full of that. If, if not, there's, I think there's some more beer <laughs> to, to drink. But um, why? Why does this matter? And, and what I'd like to do before we discuss some use cases is sort of take a little quick tour down some history. And uh, really sort of look back at the computing era. And uh, I can go as slow, as fast through this as I, I need to. Um, but, but basically, um, when computing started, everything was in these computers called mainframes, right? And these mainframes were connected to dumb terminals, or you had like these uh, punch cards that you fed your program in to run. Um, and that provided a lot of value. That was a huge, huge, um, innovation shift from having everything in teletypes and files and folders, right? Being able to put all of your data in this central location where everybody in the company could access, but, but they were very expensive and only the large, large, large companies could afford to do it in the large colleges, right? So even in school, you would actually maybe be in a smaller school and you would actually connect to the mainframe in Chicago or the mainframe in Atlanta, or the mainframe in Raleigh. Then we started to get PCs, and the client-server sort of innovation era began. And with PCs, now you didn't have to have all your data up into these central mainframes. You were able to bring them down, bring them down to your desktop, actually build apps on your desktop, store data locally. This was incredibly empowering, right? You didn't have to pay um, for time with a mainframe, you actually could run your code at your house. You know, it's pretty cool. Um, so that really um, shifted computing as we know, knew it and opened up a lot of innovation in this space and really started introducing software. You actually had software stores. Does anyone remember software stores and going to the store and actually buying software off the shelf? Right? <laughs> <laughs> that was incredible. That was amazing. Those three and a half discs. You know, you, uh, I think uh, Windows 3.1 was like 21 discs. You had to load to get the operating system. It's awesome. Um, and, and then the internet. Clearly, the, the, the internet came. And um, what's interesting about this era, I still remember the day when, what is this AWOD? AWOD thing? The world of difference? What is this thing? Um, what is WWW? <laughs> and then the hours and hours of people as they ate food and gave their credit card to their servers to go and pay for their meal, debating whether they're going to really buy a book online, right? <laughs> With their credit card, you know, and agonizing over that, having huge debates about that. I remember a lot of uh, articles saying, you know, Amazon's never going to make it. What a silly idea. Does anyone remember that? Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, so, so this thing just sort of just totally went off the scale in innovation, right? Because anyone, even a six-year-old kid that could type, could publish a website. Huge. Ideas were getting out there. He, anybody could launch an idea and share it with the world. Um, what a, a huge innovation. But, but at the time, when it was just starting, everyone was like, I don't know, what kind of modem should I get? 56K? Uh, 16K? Yeah. Um, 9600 baud? <laughs> remember that? Um, but, but uh, you know, it's changed our lives. It changes how we communicate. It, it, it changes how we share information. 
Uh, and then you had the smartphone, right? <laughs> so I, I remember hearing um, Dvorak um, just totally go off in 2006 about Apple and how just really what a bad decision it is to get the phone market. You know, Motorola <laughs> owns it, you know, Verizon owns it, all these guys on it, and it's just a horrible decision. This is going to be the worst decision Apple's ever made. Um, well, I don't think that's the case, right? These things have completely changed the way we think about innovation. And just listening to the finalists today, they're impacted by this ability to use these mobile computers we're carrying around to get data, to get information into citizens who, frankly, probably couldn't access that or, or didn't want to take the time to access that. Like, um, I, I know for some of my family members, it's still an incredible, stressful situation for them to buy a computer. Like, how much memory does it need? How much disk space does it need? You know, I've got to go talk to a computer guy at a store, you know. But a phone, you know, you just walk in the store and say, I want to download music. And you get a phone, right? Um, pretty easy. And next thing you know, you've got this huge, powerful compute device in your pocket. Uh, someone said that we're all just literally sideboards. We just haven't melted the phone <laughs> into the body. You know? We're all walking around with these phones, and, and it's great. Um, the ideas that come up when you have that kind of ability to connect. And so why I take you through this sort of history, you know, at the time in each one of these uh, eras, there was a lot of buzz of the promise, right? And there was a lot of naysayers, how this is not going to solve all the world's problems, right? And I think with anything, any new technology, we have that gap, and we have to figure out where is the, the middle going to land? Where is the sweet spot of that gap? So what is next? What is next on that list of technology innovation? And I'm going to tell you it's not blockchain. <laughs> Um, so, I, I think there's a couple of things that I think is next. Um, be curious to hear what you guys think is next, but one thing I think that's next, and I know if uh, Larry's still here, he might agree with me um, from Riot, but I think the Internet of Things is definitely uh, next on that list. Um, but one of the challenges we have with the Internet of Things is something called cybersecurity. How many of you guys are familiar with cybersecurity, right? It's part of our lives. Anytime you release an app, is it secure? Can they hack into it? Can they do anything with it? Um, blockchain could be a potential solution to help mitigate that problem, right? Because if all the de uh, devices have their own wallet and they have their own public key, then you could use that and use your public <coughs> key off of your app to make sure that you're the only one sending the transaction on the chain. And another idea is this notion of Web 3.0. Web 3.0 is basically this idea of moving from sort of the four or five major sort of internet distribution channels that we have, you know, um, Apple, Amazon, uh, Google, and Facebook into this decentralized web era where all of that sort of uh, becomes available in decentralized data. And you don't have to rely on uh, centralized stores to communicate and to share data. But at the end of the day, this technology is super interesting. It's worth the, the study if you are having uh, to share data with other parties and you want to verify that you know, the best way to verify that transactions are working together is being able to both share the ledger, right? So there's no hidden data. So um, if you have, you know, pain points in, in what you're doing, which involves working with multiple parties in a trustless way, definitely give blockchain a look and, um, you know, basically have an eye out for solutions, obviously in finance, healthcare, and government. I 
think there's a lot of solutions. Uh, clearly, I'm from healthcare, and I know we've got a long way to go to widen that road, right? And it seems like every time we throw the technology to it, it, it maybe arguably makes it a little bit worse. So maybe blockchain can come in and, and start making that better, and I also think the same with government. But I'd uh, love to talk to you afterwards if you have something and, and to discuss a use case. And uh, that's all I have. So thank you very much. <laughs>